Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another Learn Live session. I'm Glenn Stevens. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Jason DeVuga. We're going to take you on an exciting road trip of building classical machine learning models with supervised learning today. Hey, Jason, how are you doing? Great, Glenn. How are you? I I'm well, thanks. Now, Good to be um, back with you. <laughs> excellent, likewise. So I'm a senior content developer here at Microsoft. Uh, I work on mostly on the Learn Live product at the moment. Uh, Jason, do you want to introduce yourself to the, the lovely audience out there? Yeah, I'm a senior product manager here at Microsoft, and I work on ML and AI content. Uh, so, of course, uh, that's my my connection here. You work mostly with uh, Learn Live. I work mo mostly with ML and AI, and together, here we are. <laughs> Excellent. It's the superpowers together, hopefully. And we've got a lot of people um, calling in from all over the planet here as well. So uh, we are live. Keep your messages coming through. Uh, ask questions. Uh, as we go through. Uh, but this is actually the second in a series that we're running. Today is the second on that list, Build Classical Machine Learning Models. Um, uh, last week, we did Introduction to Machine Learning. We had lots of people come along and listen to that, which was lovely. And we're going to be doing some, some more great content as we go through. This is actually just five of the nine episodes that we're seeing. We're going to be looking at uh, machine learning, regression models, testing and validating learning models, and, and a range of others as well. Um, yeah, we didn't want to put all of the modules up here because some of them would seem too intimidating uh, in the first and second week. But by the time we get to week five and six, you'll be ready. Yeah, you will. It'll be it'll be awesome. And there's also a, a link on the, the top of the screen there as well. If you do want to download the content or just follow along with the learning path on Microsoft Learn, it's aka.ms slash learnml. And, and all of the, the content that we're, we're bringing you is actually based on existing loan content. So you can actually just sit back and, and watch in your own time, experience what we're doing, and then go back and do the loan modules. Or you can follow along if you choose to as well. And uh, so by the way, all of the compute environment, all of the code is provided for you right there at those uh, at those aka.ms links. Now, you'll notice the first uh, the first link that, that Glenn wrote, read off didn't have the dash classical ML. That was for the whole learning path. This one right here, this link right here, is specifically for the module that we'll be going through and teaching today. But again, compute environment, code provided for you. You can tweak the code, you can play with it, but if you just wanna follow along and do what we do, it's right there for you, all provided for free. Excellent. Um, now, an interesting question we have already, Jason, is that can you please start out with the definition of supervised learning? I think we might need to do a little bit of a, a definition, but not a huge one because we'll get into the, the depths a little bit later. Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely, definitely talk about uh, what is machine learning. In fact, I I think I think I'm I'm gonna punt on that just a few minutes and and say, you know what, give us uh give us just a minute to get to the definition of supervised learning. It's something we plan to answer there. So Let's first talk about what we're going to focus on today, which is what is the definition of supervised and unsupervised learning, which is which is why I said give, give us just a minute and we'll get there. <laughs> As you can see, it's part of the plan. Um, and when we're going to look at how cost of our cost functions in detail affect our learning process. And I know we talked a little bit about cost functions last week, but we're going to look at that in a lot more detail as well as our optimizers. And you can see actually we're talking about gradient descent. So there's a new uh, new uh, piece of, uh, of jargon, a new glossary term for us to uh, for us to focus in on. That's a particular optimization. And we'll also tweak around and play with our learning rates to see how that can affect our learning process. In other words, what we're doing is peeling back the layer just a little bit on the things we did last week, that overview level last week. Does that sound about right? It, it does sound about right. And, and don't worry if you're not comfortable with the terms yet. We'll explain them as we go through. So by the end of it, you go, oh, okay, so what are you talking about here? Some of the knowledge builds on top of the previous knowledge, so it'll take a little bit of time to get there. But, uh, but keep in mind that we are live and interactive as well. So if you have any questions, uh, send them through to the chat. Say hello, even just a, a greeting. It would be lovely to hear from, from you wherever you are on the planet. Absolutely. And of course, in addition to us being here to answer your questions, we have a team of amazing moderators, highly, highly skilled experts in machine learning who are on our various chat channels. Of course, we prefer that you're hanging out on the Learn TV chat channel, but some of you are are on our different venues. <laughs> and we've got people 
handling the chat and helping out there uh, and all those channels. And, and really, these people are amazing experts. So um, a lot of the times they're going to answer questions uh, we wouldn't be able to answer even on the live stream right there in chat. <laughs> But but I do hope that they threw a few of the questions our way because we do enjoy uh, enjoy answering them on, on the stream as well. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's very true. I feel very privileged to have everyone here on the call. Awesome. So why don't we get into the, the content for today, Jason? Where are we going to start? Super duper. Well, we've got our what is supervised learning. And actually, just a little bit of a break before we before we really dive in but i will say that supervised learning is defined as training against a correct answer um, and what that means is when we have our training data we, we have a known correct answer and we're going to be using that as our as our measurement of what we're trying to get better at at doing we're going to try to get better at our, our machine learning model predicting correct answers. And that, of course, implies that there is a correct answer and that our historical data has it. Um, but, but even in a broader sense, what we're going to be doing today is using supervised learning examples to dig further into the general machine learning process. So the general process of, of optimizing and of cost functions. Um, that's that's the real benefit today is that we're looking at the general uh, overview, the general process at a deeper level, at a more hands-on level than we than we got to last week. But but yeah, for sure we will focus on some of the uh, specifics of supervised learning. You want to tell us about the scenario we're going to use today, Glenn? Oh yeah, of course. So just like last week, we have a scenario that we're running through, and in this case, uh, we're doing a scenario based on a farm that's based in Washington State. And it's an elk farm that's been held onto for a number of generations. And the, the farmers there had known that normally you don't feed the grain uh, to the elk uh, roughly when it's a bit too cold. So about zero degrees Celsius or 30 degree, 32 degrees Fahrenheit if we're using your, your American units over there, Jason. Um, so we followed that process, but we've noticed over time that the elk have not been responding well. We're worried that the temperatures are changing through climate change, and we want to look at that data and see if we can see where the trends are going up, for example, and see if we need to shift that date. It's an important business decision for the farm to look after their, their health and safety of the elk as well. So that's, that's what we're going to, do, going to do. We're going to look at the historical data, see where the trends are happening in a way to see if we can predict what it's going to be for subsequent years. Super. That about covers it. So, all right. I see the question again. What is supervised learning? Does that mean I'm about to answer it? I am about to, but just not quite. Yet. I'm still teasing. Uh, <laughs> now, now the two main types of, of machine learning algorithm, at least in the in the classic machine learning world, are supervised and unsupervised. Those are our two our two original categories, if you will. Now, in the last five or so years, it's exploded to where to where some things that you might hear about or read about in the press are definitely in the gray area of where they're at um, in terms of of how they measure correctness. But but we're gonna really zone in on on these original two types, and they're they're kind of original buckets, so that we can keep out of the gray areas, if you will. So. So unsupervised, we're going to define that first so we can contrast supervised to it. Unsupervised actually is a type of machine learning algorithm where, where we don't have a correct answer, um, where, we, where, where we aren't measuring against some known correct value. If you think back to last week, for those of you who were with us last week, our correct answer uh, in other words, the thing we were trying to predict and then the thing we were able to, to measure against to see whether or not we had a good prediction or a bad prediction with our machine learning model, it was dog boot size, right, for our, our sled dogs. They had to wear boots. And we could see using historical data what the correct boot size would be. And so we were training a model to, to try to see how good we could get at guessing the dog's boot size. But our historical data had a boot size. That was an absolute known correct value. With unsupervised learning, we're dealing with problems that that don't necessarily have a known correct. Uh, and, and the classic example is customer segmentation. Uh, I'll talk, I'll, I'll, I'll actually use a, a very concrete and, and simplified example for customer uh, segmentation. So imagine that we have a, um, a, a store selling t-shirts 
and we want to decide what sizes our small, medium, and large T-shirt should be, right? So, so what what measurements, Glenn, might might we have for our T-shirts? In other words, things that would be inputs to our models. Right. We might have just the the dimensions, uh, are like the, uh, that a tailor would use, for example. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, we could have like 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 our, our chest size and our, and our shoulder width and, and waist size, things like this. And maybe we have that for a lot of our customers. So what we wanna do is knowing that we're only gonna sell three sizes, we need to cluster, this is known as a clustering algorithm, we need to cluster those, those sizes so that we can find kind of the, the middlest ground at three different central points so that, we can, so that we can have the happiest total set of people. Right. So so this would be what's known as a clustering algorithm. And there's no correct answer using different cost functions. So we're going to talk a lot about cost functions today. And using different cost functions, we might come up with different best clusters. Um, so, so now I'm going to use a little bit more of an abstract example, um, just so you can picture really in your head what I mean by these, these, different, uh, these different cost functions and these different ways to come up with clusters. Imagine we just had a, a picture of a spiral galaxy. So you can picture that spiral galaxy. It's got its arms kind of wrapping around the, 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 the kind of center point there. Now, if I wanted to, to slice that into say five or six clusters, let's say there were five or six spiral arms, there are different ways I could slice and dice that picture. I could have it be basically sliced like a pie I could have each one of those cluster arms, or uh, sorry, spiral arms be a cluster. You could have just, just clusters that were blobs. Um, and all of those are relatively valid answers depending on what you're trying to do with this picture of a galaxy. And so, so different clustering algorithms legitimately could come up with different answers to how would I cluster this, this scatter plot that looks like a, that looks like a spiral galaxy. Yeah, so I imagine it might cluster based on the distance between the other stars or or the, the density of a star, for example. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And there's slightly different ways to measure that, like whether you're focused on density or total distance and things like that, right? So so right. exactly. But, but all of that becomes a matter of cost function. And, and, and so we could have the same entire other process, but then the cost function of how you measure density versus di or distance or things like your total distance that that's going to drive what ends up what ends up coming out as our as our final answer. So that's unsupervised learning. Now back to supervised learning. I think we may be those of us who were here last week will will realize that this is much closer the supervised learning where we have a answer to what we did when we had our, our doggy boots. So, so that's exactly what we're going to be focusing on again. Uh, in terms of, of most of our classic models, it, it's going to, th that we're gonna deal with throughout this course, it's going to be our, our primary focus. So we're going to do things like regression and classification where, where we can train against data, where we know what class it belongs to, what category it belongs to. Or, or with regression, like our boots, we can tell what number we're trying to get out of it. So that's going to be most of our focus, but we're still gonna see that that our different cost functions can matter. Awesome. What so do we do with our labels, Glenn? How, how, does, how do those come in, the, the, our, our labels <laughs> for, for training? And actually, let's, I'm sorry. I, I okay. jumped ahead because I, I asked you, what do we do with our labels? And I didn't really zone in on this yet, did I? No, because not, not there's quite. Because a little yeah. bit more jargon. <laughs> well, well, I think understanding the jargon jargon is is really useful because there is a lot of terminology. And even last week, I think we mentioned that you'll find that some of the the terminology will be used in in statistics, in machine learning, and, and in other fields as well. So if you feel like you'd like to understand a term a little bit more, let us know. We'll explain a little bit more too. Um, I also. Oh, we've got a question in the chat as well. Is there any way to estimate the performance of unsupervised learning models? It's a great question. Yeah, so so I think again, it's gonna it's gonna depend on the on the uh, definition of the of the the word performance, which which always is is going to be very related to to our cost functions. Um, so so the answer is our 
our metrics that are important to us are not always the same as our cost functions, um, but it's definitely related, right? So we use a cost function to try to uh, to try to to estimate what we really care about in the real world. And one could argue that 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 a clustering the clustering cl cost function for say our t-shirt sizes um, will itself give us the give us the um, the the interim. <laughs> performance metric, but but the real metric we're going to end up caring about, I guess, is going to be our satisfied customers. How satisfied are our customers with the with the t-shirts we we select? That's ultimately the metric we're going to look at. And if 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 in the future of selling our t-shirts we realize that we have less satisfied customers, we're going to need to go back and revisit all the all the systems we use to estimate how happy we expected them to be. Uh, you know, including our our, our machine learning algorithm. Yeah, and keep in mind, we'll also be revisiting that area uh, in later sessions too, where we're measuring the performance of a model. All right, so so the the jargon point here that we talked about features and labels. So features we we called inputs last week, and they're they're really the things we're going to be sending in. So last week we had our harness size. Um, this week I think we're going to have year or or date more generically as as our as our input for most of our examples. Um, and labels are our outputs or what we're trying to guess. And in fact, um, labels are actually the correct answers in, in our training data for the thing we're trying to guess even, even more specifically, right? So um, there, the, when we run our models training, the thing we compare against, the correct answer we compare against is known as the label. And now we get to what do we do with the labels after we're done training? <laughs> But we actually don't need the labels once we've done the training. It's really for that those examples, like you said, supervised learning is where you know the the right answer and you use that in order to train. So it's in, in, it's important during the training process, but not when you're executing the model. Exactly. So so remember, as we talked about last week, that our training process is part of our development cycle. So we train a model when we're developing our application. If, if our model is going to be part of our application, we have to train it before the application is not ready until we have a trained model. So even though we execute code and we use our historic data with labels during that training process, that training process is part of, part of the development loop. Um, and so once we're done with that, once we're deploying our app along with the completed model, we don't need that historic data and we don't need to know the correct answers anymore. It's now going to be our model's job to give us those 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 answers, or at least their best guesses at those answers. So look at this. We've got a lab coming up, a heads down coding time. Maybe not heads down for us because we still have to we still have to talk to folks about what we're doing, but <laughs> maybe heads down for them when they go to go to work on it. That's very true. And there's a few things we'll be going through in this exercise as well. We'll be looking at selecting a model. Uh, we'll look at the cost function again. It's an important thing. We'll look at the optimizer and the optimizer's loop or the training loop and, and show you how to basically create a, a simple model. And remember, we're using the classical format. So it's going to be slightly similar to what we did last week, Jason, don't you think? But we're kind of controlling yeah, that. We're not using a library. Like we did That's right. Week. The main difference, yeah, the main difference is going to be we're going to be focused on some code that we have right there in in our Jupyter uh, in our Jupyter notebook instead of calling into a library to do the work for us. Now, of course, simplified, we wouldn't exactly uh, we wouldn't exactly sell our implementation as a uh, as a production library. It's quite simplified, but it allows us to see what's really going on under the hood, which is which is wonderful because you're going to need to understand that if you want to start uh, debugging and revising models in the future even when you're using a library to, to build the initial model. All right, cool. Well, let's get into it. So I've got my Jupyter Notebooks here running and I've activated my sandbox. If you're following along, feel free to activate yours as well. And we've got a, a few things that we're doing here. We're going to be filtering some data, uh, looking at that weather situation that we have with the elk farm, where we, we want to look at January. We, we want to see if January is actually changing from year to year. And we have some historical data as well. We have this CSV file that has all the, the data years, I think from about what 1948 to 2017. A lot of data there, which is pretty important. And then we're gonna start filtering on the date and we'll only get the, the, the entries that are within the month of January. And then we'll output the data. Take a look. First, 
Let's have a quick look. It'll take a few seconds to execute. It's all exciting stuff. But this is, is very, very similar. Let's right see that. See that data. Yeah, and we'll we just scroll down. down at the bottom. We got a nice big chunk of it. Yeah, and and thanks for the pandas library for emitting all those records. We don't want to scroll through. Yeah, twenty five thousand records, but it's displaying it in a nice friendly Thank format you, for us at the very <laughs> least. So we've got all that that data. We've got the the shape of it here, the date, the amount of precipitation, the max temperature, the minimum temperature. So we'll probably look at things like the minute miniature temperature for our model in today's session. But it's always a good idea to have a look at the data and see the shape, and if you can visualize it too, to just to understand. A, uh... We got a comment from Musa who 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 uh, came up with a nice mnemonic for remembering features and labels. So Philo features inputs, labels outputs. Thanks, Musa. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Philo. Yes, I, I have a fear of missing out of not remembering Philo. That's really good. Excellent. Um, so the the next thing we want to do with the data is we want to look at the January temperatures, and. And look at it over time and you can actually see the minimum temperatures are steadily increasing in this chart as well which is i think very useful any any thoughts on that jason yeah i mean like you said we can we can plainly see by looking at it for for more than a second maybe if you look at it for a very quick second they might look fairly flat but but we start to see that slight upward trend pretty quickly yeah and so so this uh, this is a good sign that we might want to think about that grain feed uh, schedule we yeah, might looks, be on the right track. That, that's right. It looks like this this year was a, a particularly cold year, but otherwise it's going up slowly but steadily. Yeah. Awesome. So what we want to do here is, is look at the, the values again. Um, like you can see here, machine learning works better when the, the X and Y axis have roughly the same range of values. And we'll look at areas like normalization in another session in this series but here we want to look at the data i'll just go ahead and, and run this cell yeah but we'll spend actually... a lot more time on normalization and why it's such a good idea um in a, in a future module i think it's actually either next week or the week after that we uh that we start to look but um but we wanted to do it now because one of the things for one thing you're going to do it all the time and the thing that we're going to to immediately observe is that even though we've changed those ranges, um, if, if you look down at the bottom, it says years since 1982, we've now normalized zero. around the zero. Um, so it's it's basically years before and years after. Uh, but the and 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 the temperature is in the same boat, right? We've got some some normalization there, um, which basically just means that we've put everything on the same rough scale and centered it around zero. But the pattern, look at the pattern, is exactly the same. If we if we saw that pattern when we had the normal numbers, we Let's see the pattern up. now, it's exactly the same. What that means is when we think about what we're doing with, with these, these trend line linear regressions, uh, we're gonna get the same trend line. If we put a line through that data that's the best fit, it's going to be the best fit in both. So by normalizing this, we haven't messed with what the best fit is going to be for our parameters or for, for our, uh, well, yeah, for our parameters. So for our slope and for our intercept. Cool. And Nate has a question. Uh, and We did mention if you if there's a term you, you want to understand, let us know. Nate's done that. Thank you, Nate. Uh, the question is, what is normalization? Good question. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a good question. Um, it, it's it's it, it might be a little bit of a of a slippery slope to go down, and we do have another module for it. But 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 stated briefly, it's to cons make consistent our data. And here we've made it consistent by centering around zero, and putting our our distributions on on approximately the same scale. So we're not going from negative three thousand. Uh, to positive 3,000 on one axis and from 0 0.02 to 0 0.2 on the other axis. So they're on same order of magnitude and in the in a, um, uh, center around zero in this case. But 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 basically it means to 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 make normal, if you will, um, but to to apply some sort of standardization or some sort of um, uh, normal normalizing. I guess I'm I'm begging the term there, but <laughs> but but to put it on a, on a standard uh, scale. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Nate, and thanks, and, Jason, for and, and we'll we'll talk about why we would do that. Um, maybe we'll even have a little time to touch on it uh, after uh, at the end of exercise three today. 
Uh, but if we don't, we have a, a whole module for it. Okay, excellent. Well, let's keep going. So the next thing we're going to look at is the model. So in in this particular exercise today, we're going to do something slightly different. So in last week's exercise, we used an existing library to, to create the model. In this particular case, we're going to create our own class that represents the model. So we'll have a, a class called my model. It'll have an initialization. We'll be using the slope and intercept just like before in last week's. So remember that y equals mx plus b chart that we're using. We'll use that same ordinary least squares algorithm. And we'll also have a prediction value. So we can pass in a date and then determine once we know what the slope is and interception after training, we'll be able to predict future values potentially and work out what next year's weather is going to be. So let me yeah. just go ahead, Jason. As you said, this is essentially just applying that same slope and intercept. And, and we can see literally predict uses that MX plus M times X plus B. So, so your input, uh, or, or rather your, uh, yeah, well, your input times your parameter plus your, uh, plus your, your bias or your, your intercept. So your other parameter. So, yep. Awesome. Mx plus B with, with M being your, uh, your input there. Cool. So we've got that, that model created. The next step here is we're going to display the, the data again. So it's going to show the trend line this time, but you can see the trend line is that it's just a flat line at zero. And the reason for that is that we haven't trained the model yet. Once we train the model, we should be able to determine what the slope is going to be, what the intercept is going to be over time. So yeah, that, that's our, our model value currently. Let's go, and, oh, go ahead and- Rodrigo's question. Rodrigo wants to know uh, how many years before or after zero should we be considering? Um, and the basic answer to this question is as much good data as you have. Um, there is some nuance to that, that that we'll learn more and more about as we talk about things like data cleansing, um, especially in, in next week's module. But the short answer is as many years as you have good data for, go ahead and feed it into the system. More data, the general rule is more data is better data as long as it's, as long as it's clean. Awesome. As long as it's accurate. So the next step we're going to do is actually implement a cost function or the objective function. What is it that we're trying to measure here? And in this particular case here, we've got the, the estimated temperature minus the actual temperature. So we want to see the differences in the temperature to what we predict versus what's there historically and use that in order to train the data to adjust what that intercept is going to be to adjust what that slope is going to be. Absolutely. Does that be a, a fair fair statement, Jason? I think I think you said it perfectly. Yep, we're going to uh, we're going to as we're doing a training process need to know how wrong we are, um, mm -hmm. so that we can get better. And this right here defines wrong. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Which is awesome. So, what's the cost of it? Like, how expensive is this? What? How big a mistake are we making yep. in our training in order to to train the data better? So that particular step was actually just defining a method for the cost function. It wasn't actually doing the work just yet. And the next step here is where we're going to implement the optimizer. So the optimizer, we have a class here that we'll use that we've written. If you scroll up to the very start of this um, unit in the module, you'll actually see a class we've created called my optimizer, which allows you to do essentially the, the heavy calculus that works out where we should change, right? And, and by the way, the, the, well, the calculus isn't that heavy, but it does do the calculus, <laughs> and we're going to implement that in our third exercise today. But but we'll we'll we'll, we'll take this little bits at a time. So for right now, we've just got that we've just got that that method call to to do it for us. Excellent. So and then we've got the ability to to train and at least do one iteration based on some model data. So our next method here is called train one iteration. It's got the model inputs, the the actual temperatures. And, and essentially what it's going to do is use the model to predict the value and then see how wrong it is. And based on how wrong it is, adjust the values so we can get to what should be a, a closer value. Uh, that's the, the fundamental of it. So again, this is really just defining the, a method again to train one iteration. We haven't, haven't actually started training just yet. Well, let me go ahead and, and run that cell. Yeah, while you, while you do that, I will uh, talk through what it's, oh, it's already executed. I'll still talk. Um, <laughs> we can see that 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 in this, while, while there's a bunch of comments, other than that, there's very little code. And that code that is in this loop is actually calling the methods that we already defined, which we know are also relatively small. So we've got our, our model predict, which is making a prediction based off of an untrained model now. So everything's zeros. Of course, it's not going to work very well. 
Then we use that cost function to see how badly we did. Then we use the optimizer and the, the knowledge of how badly we did to get an update for our parameters. And then finally, we update our slope and our intercept parameters, and then we could try again. Actually, can, can you scroll down a little bit so we can see the result of the first run? Well, it hasn't actually run it. It's really oh, you're right. That's just, yeah. just defining the method. <laughs> just yet. Yeah. But, but you're, you're very close. In fact, the, the next method here is where we train one iteration based on that model. And once we, we train it, we'll actually output the intercept and the slope again. So if I go ahead and run this, we should actually be able to see the output. This is what it was before, zero, zero, before training. And then after training, we can see that we've adjusted the, the slope here a little. And it, in fact, if I keep clicking on this particular cell, yeah. I can see that the You keep the updating values those parameters. Yeah. So if I want to train the model 4,000 times, I'm not going to click on this button 4,000 times, Jason. I'm actually going to, I'm going to put this in a loop. And then that will that will actually That sounds like a better way to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's Let's automate where we can. So the, the next block of code is really doing that. It's just running through that loop, essentially training the model with more and more data, with all the data that we have based on the historical data, and then just saying, here's what we think the intercept and the slope will be at the end of that time. And then we'll show that visually so we can see if it matches uh, what, we, what we expect of that data over time. So there's the training. It's beginning. We've done 4,000 iterations. And now we can see that the trend line based on that historical data. And that trend line looks a lot better than the flat line at zero that we saw before. It sure does. Yeah. That looks like something that actually might do a good job of predicting our temperature. Cool. And, and in theory, we could just go, well, what's going to be the next value for next year and put that into the model predict value once we've trained the model and actually get our result, right? Outstanding. Cool. So that's a, a look at, at setting up a simple model using classical techniques. Um, any other thoughts, Jason, before we head back to the slides? No, I think this is a good time to get back to the slide and, and, and continue talking about cost functions. This is really one of our more important topics today. Cool. And also feel free uh, for everyone in the, in the audience uh, to send us through questions uh, like you've been doing. Yes, it's been fantastic. Love the engagement, love the uh, good questions and good suggestions. All right, cost functions. We, we've talked about them a lot. We're going to talk about them a lot more. They, they, they are, are absolutely vital in, in getting to the correct answer because they tell us in what ways we're wrong. Uh, and and we, we actually spent a little bit more time talking about it in the unsupervised learning example than, than say, if you read through the module, we, we actually are pretty quick on it. But I thought for this live session, It'd be really nice to to expand on the cost function during that unsupervised section because it it plays really well with what we're doing now, with what we're doing right here, which is talking about how we can change and affect the progress of what we're doing by changing the cost function. By using a slightly different cost function, we can get fairly drastically different results. And when we when we go further into machine learning uh, and, and get into things like deep learning, um, different cost functions, fairly elaborate cost functions, uh, can can actually be used to to do amazing things because our our mathematic basis still applies as long as we can put all of our inputs into into features and then define some cost function that defines that def that. The cost function will be will be uh, satisfied or minimal when 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 our um, when, when we're happy with the result. If we can somehow mathematically define happy, then we can optimize towards that goal, and we can do all sorts of things. That's where you see like like these these algorithms that do painting, or these algorithms that can play Pac-Man better than you can. It actually comes down to elaborately defined cost functions. Believe it or not. Now we're not going to get into that level of sophistication for our linear regression talk today. But I wanted to understand that that's why cost functions are so vital. Now, by the way, cost, whoops, wrong slide, cost, error, and loss. Uh, they do have subtly different definitions in different contexts. In general, we're going to use them interchangeably. Um, 
the 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 thing that's maybe most universally applied is that 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 at, for a full run for a full model run, we'll say cost. Uh, but you might see loss used for individual records, or you might you might occasionally see that used for cost as well. So mostly they're used interchangeably, and you don't need to worry about embarrassing yourself if you use those three terms interchangeably in a discussion with just about anyone. And remember, the the whole idea is that if we can minimize our cost, then a, a, as we define the definition of cost, then we're going to be able to train that model. And, and for, for this particular chart right here that we just saw a little while ago, we defined minimum cost as, as the total length for all of these dots towards the trend line. So actually the mean, but total or mean is, is gonna come out to the same thing. And, and that's what we optimized for. We wanted the minimum distance for each dot to the trend line. And that's what we got when we got that, that curve right there or slope rather right there. Glenn, anything to add there? No, yeah, I, I think that's that's a fair call. I was actually looking at Rodrigo's question in the, the chat that he sent through, where is the define the, the total loop counts, which was a question from the previous exercise. Um, oh, from yeah, so exercise. no, that's all right. I, Rodrigo, the, the total loop count isn't set. It's not an individual value. It's actually going through all the data from that data set in the CSV file. And it's just outputting the, the number every 400 records. But when it gets to the end, that's when it stops. Uh, there, there actually were, it actually did go through the data uh, mm -hmm. multiple times uh, as well. You went through yeah. all the records multiple times. It did. Um, we could, uh, we'll actually see these again. So see these again, so we'll try to get back to it. <laughs> cool. All right, uh, so. So let's 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 actually uh, get ready to jump into our next uh, our next uh, demo here. We have actually defined this pretty well already. What is a cost function? So so I don't think we need to belabor it just because we have another slide. <laughs> let's get into that demo. Like I said, we we definitely talked ahead when we when we focused on some of the, uh, the the cost function part of the the unsupervised learning and the clustering algorithms earlier. All right, yet another demo. What are we going to do now? But well, we're actually going to look at, at the cost functions and we'll actually compare multiple cost functions to see where a cost function may differ and what you can do about it. So that there's a few things. Um, we'll compare the cost functions and then we'll look at the, the differences in action in a little, little bit more depth. Uh, it, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to just going to point out to everyone that, of course, this is a lot. There's new jargon. There's new concepts. This is why. We're going through a module that already exists for self-service. We're giving you an overview. We're walking through it with you. But absolutely, you should visit again and plan to do this again. You should definitely plan to go through this content again by yourself, execute the code. Hey, look for where the loop definition is in that, in that algorithm and understand all of it yourself. Look up the definitions of the words we're throwing at you because, yes, we're throwing a lot of it at you very quickly. Awesome. Good point, Jason. All right. Well, let me just share my screen. We'll jump into the, the next exercise. Fantastic. All right. And <laughs> all right. So this one, like I said before, we're actually going to look at the data again, but we're going to look at some different cost functions that we're operating. Uh, we'll look at uh, the kinds of relationship a, a model has as well. And we'll also set up some different data structures here too. So again, we're doing something very similar to the first exercise where we're loading the data. That's what we'll do here. In fact, I'll just run that cell. It might take a little bit of time. Again, we're reading from that same CSV file. And here we're also creating a new column in the, in the data as well called year. And this is actually looking for the midpoint for the year as well. So we don't have to use the, the year exactly. It, what do you think about that particular approach, Jason? Is that that sensible, you think? Yes. It, well, in this case, what we're doing is we're turning that into a single number that we can we can then chart and treat as a single number by by turning it into into a decimal. We have a now continuous value representing our date, representing our time instead of, uh, you know, instead of having two different fields or multiple fields that wouldn't train, wouldn't be able to to have a trend line as as accurately. Right, exactly. Um, now, also in this exercise, we're also capturing some desired dates. So we're going to look at the dates in 10-year increments, 1950 all the way through to 
2010 and then also 2017, probably to represent something closer to 2020. And then we'll we'll copy that data and then we'll also print that data set out. So if I scroll through that towards the end, we can see we have the, the data just for those particular years. And and now for, as for that part, why are we cherry picking a few records? The, the, the truth is this part doesn't necessarily fit into our scenario. Uh, what it does fit into is the point we're going to try to make about cost functions during this exercise and having less data makes it easier for us to uh, for us to kind of crash the car, if you will. Um, <laughs> With, with 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 more data, it, it's it's a more adaptable process, and we'd need to train for a long time to run into problems. We're trying to demonstrate quickly, so we're going to use a very small amount of data, which will allow us to to run into the problems quickly for demonstration purposes. Understand that even with a lot of data, these are these are things that can apply. Yeah, awesome. All right, so let's have a look at the the two cost functions. And in fact, you can see them here: the sum of square differences and the sum of absolute differences. So they're very similar. They're using the same inputs, which is the estimate and output, but they're using different formulas. One's using the sum of squares, and the other one's using the absolute differences between the numbers. So subtracting the estimate from the actual in the, in the terms of absolute differences, and then getting the absolute value there, or the sum of squares where it's it's getting the estimate and actual squaring that value, and then summarizing those particular values here as well. So let's go ahead and run that. That's really just going to, excuse me, uh, just define the particular methods in this particular case. So these are essentially going to be our two different cost functions that we're going to, to, to compare and contrast here. Right, and, and we've got a, we, excuse me, we have some simple examples. So we've got an array here for the actual, which is one and three, and the estimate, which is two and two. So we use those as inputs to the both of those values and then actually see how they compare. So in this particular case, there's actually not too much difference, but but we've had a, an error of one for each estimate. Um, so if we change the values slightly, we'll actually see that there's a difference between the sum of squares and the sum of the absolute values. And and Jason, we, we, we were talking previously, not in this session, but uh, before about the, the differences between sum of squares and absolute differences and the impact that that might have on data. Do you want to speak to that yeah. again? If you're able to scroll it just enough so that I can see both of those input boxes on, on screen, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to both of those. So if, if we look at that first input box, and we've had the same two cost functions here, right? The first one where, where our errors are between one and two, if you look at the actual and the estimate, right? So the first the first uh, index or zeroth index, I suppose, we have one and two, and the difference there would be negative one. And that is going to square to one. Three minus two is one, and that squares to one. Add those together and we get two. So the sum of squared differences is two. For the sum of absolute differences, now in this case, this is where we just take the absolute value of the difference. So one minus two is negative one. The absolute difference is one, or the absolute value of that is one. Three minus two is one. The absolute value is one. So again, they sum to two. So in, for that case, we have this exact same, same error difference. Now, by the way, why not just sum of differences? The answer is because if we had one that was negative one and one that was positive one, we wouldn't want them to cancel each other out to sum to zero and make it look like there was no error. So what we do is we have two different possible techniques at play here that will basically get rid of negatives. So sum of squares, sum of absolutes, both cancel out the negatives and, and give us a, a basically a magnitude that we need to correct for. Now, what happened in the second example though is one minus one is zero, that's squared is zero, and three minus two is two, that squared is four, those total to four. For our absolute difference, zero and two again, but we're just going to absolute those to two, add them up to two. So we have at four and two. What this is telling us is that the sum of squared differences has the effect of, of magnifying outliers or, or of magnifying the distance as the distance gets greater in, in the in, in absolute terms, it actually gets even greater still because we're squaring, it's literally exponential, the differences. So, so 
using the square error has the effect of, of exasper exacerbating outliers. And, and we'll see what that means in very concrete terms, but I wanted to walk through these examples. Yeah, and, and Nate has a question from the chat as well. Uh, how do we get to the two cost functions, um, the sum of squares and the sum of the absolute values? But uh, from, from my take, those are actually pretty consistent uh, mechanisms for evaluating cost in statistics. So imagine that we're just using that, right? Yeah, the, the, the reality is that right now we're using some examples that have been around for literal centuries um, to keep things, you know, to keep things where at that, that intro level. And so um, the, the actual linear regression or ordinary least squares that we're using is, is, is something that's been around for centuries in statistics. Um, we, now, we now claim it in machine learning, but it, it predates machine learning. And uh, so do these particular cost functions. The idea is is literally just to get the difference and then make sure we have no net negatives. So we want the magnitude of the difference without you know without a, a sign. Awesome. So let's actually go ahead and and execute that training like we did before. But this time we'll actually be able to see the difference with the cost functions. So we'll first off run by using the sum of squares. So by the way, that. that Microsoft Custom Linear Regressor that is just exactly what we defined in the last in the last uh, exercise. So so nothing nothing creepy or magical going on there, just, right. just what we did last time. Right, so we're just training the model and then we're plotting it as well to see what happens. Now, if I look at that data, then it looks like the trend line is going up for that. But it also, like you were saying before, the squaring it really exaggerates some of the core values. So in 1950, we had a really cold year. So that value is even more exaggerated. So the trend line is slightly going up here which, which is kind of interesting because I think if I remove that 950 value, I would imagine the, the trend line looks like it could be going down. Yeah, I totally agree. It looks like it might even be going down a little bit without 1950, but man, it's going sharply up or fairly sharply up with that with that 1950 value in there and with us using the uh, the squared difference. All right, cool. So that's the sum of the squares. Let's have a look at the absolute differences now. We'll go ahead and run that. And this is going to use the sum of absolute differences cost function, where the previous one was using the sum of squares. And this one looks a little bit more accurate. So it, it's slightly going up, but that 1950 year isn't pulling the whole thing down to the extent it was before. Yeah, I think I think we're probably imagine we can probably imagine here that 1950 is still having an influence because it's still a bigger difference. And I mean, mm. it's still going to pull down uh, in, in some some level harder than everything that's closer. It's it's because it's we're still trying to minimize this distance, but we haven't we haven't made that an exponential difference in this case because we're using just the absolute value of the difference, right? That, that's right. And, and keep in mind, we're also using data points from every 10 years. If we had every single year, then that line would probably be a little bit more reflective of what's really happening. Right. And, and that goes back to my earlier point about, about mm. look, we, we cherry picked some data here, some small, although it's, it's, while it's cherry picked, it's still actually representative because it's every 10 years. It's not like, it's not like we picked only some, some really dirty values. So they're real values. And you can really see that, that with a smaller data set, we exacerbate the problem. And with, with, of course, the, uh, the, the non-optimal selection of cost function, it's worth pointing out that generally speaking, People regard uh, practitioners regard the the um, the squared error as a as a more safe choice than the absolute error, but it's it's not always, and you you have to experiment with your models and with your data prep. Excellent, good point. Awesome. So that takes us through the the end of this section, looking at the cost functions, just so we can compare the, the differences to our our values based on the the formula that we're using. And so it's it's really quite an important thing to get the cost function right for your model that you're using. Uh, any other thoughts before we jump back to the slides, Jason? No, let's jump back. In fact, uh, it's actually time for uh, for our game show round. Oh, knowledge checks. Love it. This All right, is... so everyone gets to play along at home at uh, <laughs> aka.ms slash learn live TV and use the chat to uh, test your knowledge. Excellent. And we've got a few questions. Jason, I'm going to ask you the questions if that's okay. Please do. All right. Awesome. Question one, what is the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning? I feel like we've we've gone through this a few times. So I, I think our, our, we, our we listeners might, are going to get this. We might have given our opinion on this, huh? Yeah. So, is it, 
Is it A, supervised learning requires human supervision where unsupervised learning doesn't? Is it B, supervised learning always uses an optimizer, but unsupervised never does? Is it C, supervised learning trains a model by comparing estimates to correct answers? The cost function for unsupervised learning doesn't need correct answers. So let's see, is it supervised learning requires human supervision? No, no, it has nothing to do with a human just standing and watching the model train. Supervised learning uses an optimizer, but unsupervised never does. That's not true, and everybody uses an optimizer. And supervised learning, <laughs> everybody uses the optimizer. Supervised learning trains a model by comparing estimates to correct answers, or comparing predictions, we might also say, right, to correct answers. Uh, so basically, the output of the model, we compare to correct answers. And of course, that is correct, and so unsupervised learning doesn't. It compares to some other function that needs to be defined without having a correct answer to measure against. So the correct answer there is C, you know what, we've got an, an awesome group of people paying attention because every single person nice. that answered got that right. Yeah. Fantastic, folks. All right, moving on to question two. Question two, what is the role of the cost function in supervised learning? Is it A, to maximize the cost so the objective is reached? Is it B, to calculate cost by comparing estimates to the correct answers? Or C, to update model parameters? All right, let's go with to maximize the cost so that the objective is reached. No, we don't want to maximize the cost. How about jumping to C? Is it to update model parameters? No, it's not exactly the cost function's job to do the updating. So does the cost function calculate the cost by comparing our estimates to correct answers? And of course, the answer is yes, it does. It gives us the cost, hence the name cost function. <laughs> Right, cool, and, and that's an interesting thing. So the cost function is also known as something else, right? The the we're talking about the the, the, the error, the loss function. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> oh, the objective, the objective is it the objective? Oh, there we go. Yes, the objective. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. It is our objective. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> cool, I think, oh, did I do something wrong? There's, yeah, a, there's a lot thanks, of thanks for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like you're it's, 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 you got me out of left field there. <laughs> yeah. All right. All the jargon gets us off. But by the way, our, our our audience participants did an amazing job there as well. I think it was something like 87% uh, uh, correct on that one. So bravo. Cool. Not 100%, but still, still a bravo. Yeah. And if you have any questions, keep them coming through as well while we go through it. Excellent. It sounds like we're going to move on to looking at gradient descent, which is a, a yes. very, very interesting topic. Yes. Th so this is the part where we're going to, you know, get into uh, get into actually updating our parameters. So so it is the job of our optimizer to to update the parameters and it needs to know how to do that. So when we get a a a wrong answer. We want to move towards the right answer. In other words, we get uh, we get a, a, a set of wrong answers. In other words, we get a large cost then we wanna take that large cost and, and run again with different parameters that'll be better, not just a random selection of different parameters, but, but better parameters. So the way we do that is using calculus and a process called gradient descent. And let me get my laser pointer back at work here. And, and let's, let's suppose that this was our random first starting point. Now, Notice too, Glenn. What do we got? What do we got mapped here? What are the two uh, axes on my graph before I actually get started? Because it's not my input parameter to my output anymore. That's not what I'm graphing. No, we're actually looking at the, the parameters that, are, that have been trained or during the training. So the, the bottom axis is, is looking at the the model parameters. So as we're supplying values, we want to see what the cost function is, and the, the y axis is really the cost here. So we're measuring. Um, how much of a cost that particular parameter value is. And it looks like we're actually just comparing the, the values there. We're trying to find the, the minimal cost, I would imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so here, this isn't like our our, our input from our, our data. This is the this is our parameter. So like our intercept or our slope and how and how badly, and then we're charting how badly it does against all the data. So if I set my slope to five, then run all my data through it. What was the average cost is what we're checking. And then we're checking it for, and then we're saying, okay, well, if we checked it for a large amount of, of values. Now, here's the rub. We can only check one of these at a time. And if we have a giant data set, each, each 
run through our training data, what we call an epic, each run through, more jargon, <laughs> each run through our training data could take a very long time. So we don't get the benefit most of the time of seeing what the whole picture looks like laid out before us when we change our parameters. Plus, if we have a thousand parameters, there's not really a good way to visualize a thousand dimensional graph. <laughs> So, all right, let's, let's focus on, on one parameter now. Like this is, say, our, our slope or our intercept. And, and we started off here. Now, what happens is we learn the cost function, but thanks to, thanks to knowing what the actual function that we used was, what our MX plus B values were, and thanks to calculus, and we don't really need to know a lot of calculus here. We don't really need to know any calculus, but what you do need to know is that for for basic algorithms or, or or basic equations, there are well known basic derivatives. A derivative just means the slope of that equation. So we know what our mx plus b is. We can do a very very simple process to find out what the slope of that value is. And and by doing that, and we'll show you the code. It's it's not intimidating. I promise. This is going to give us the slope here. And it's going to tell us that that oh we're actually going down to the left. We want to go down to to go down. We want to go to the left, and and so that's exactly what our our gradient descent would would tell our parameters to do. It would say update your parameters by such and such an amount, and that's exactly what we're doing. We go and do it again, and we do it again. Now gradient descent gets about here, and it says update your parameters this way and. That's that that works and we're at this low point, but we don't know that yet. Remember, we don't get to see the whole picture. And so when we update our parameters again, maybe we're like actually not at the very lowest point. Maybe we're right here and it tells us to go here. So it tells us to go here and we realize, oh, we're actually got a worse cost than last time. This is worse. And therefore we stop. We say, nope, we're going to stick with that better value we had. Now, this is a very simplified version. Of, of of gradient descent. This is actually the, the gradient descent algorithm. There are some more uh, advanced variations of gradient descent, but essentially all of our optimization algorithms derive from gradient descent. They're just they're just advancements on this this basic algorithm. Yeah. And, and it's interesting as well because when you look at that that chart, I mean we can see the, the chart of all the lines, but the optimizer really wouldn't be able to. They would just see a point in time go, you know, I think the value is lower. Let's go to the left. Uh, and until we get to a point where it's not, and then we can correct and then hover in on what we think the, the right answer is, where it's got the lowest cost. Yeah, it, it can see the slope of, of the cost, but for a given point, it can say I, it knows it's here, so it knows what the cost is, and it knows the angle. But it doesn't know how quickly the angle is going to swoop. For At any given point, the rest of this function could look like that. It doesn't know. It only knows the slope at the point it's at. Which of course, which, which, which is the, the the nature of calculus. Um, again, which again, you won't need to know anything about calculus other than how, for, for at least for these exercises, other than how to apply the 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 basic algorithms that 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 match up with with basic equations, and we'll give those to you. But there are some limitations, Glenn. Yeah, and we'll certainly see them in the next shot. But you can see that on the screen there as well. It looks like if I had a cost function like you were talking about before, where we showed the other chart, and I, I kept going to the left here on the, the chart on the right, for example, if I started to hover down that lower cost point and then started going to the left, it would actually want to go back to the right where it found that, I would say, local minima for right. that, yes, for that exactly. model parameter. And But there's actually a better value. That, that seems problematic. Why is Correct. That? Yes, and th this is right, this is this is a real problem, um, and it's a real problem especially if you don't have very many features. If you have a lot more input features, uh, remember a feature is is essentially like a column, if you will, or or a property. Uh, okay, so it's it's the boot size, it's the t-shirt uh, width, it's the the shoulder width of the t-shirt, it's our it's our year in our our example. It's it's the input, right? So so a feature is a is a property, a column an input. And the more of them you have, the less likely we're to run into these sorts of things. Uh, but it's still a possibility to run into these these local minima that prevent you from getting to the to the best value. 
There are mitigations, which we'll talk about very, very shortly. But first, let me show you one other problem that can occur and then talk about the balance of those mitigations. And, and you know what? Uh, Mika in the chat window has just asked a question, which I think is perfect for this slide, is that is there a trade trade off between optimizers between things like speed and accuracy? Absolutely. In fact, it, it, optimizers themselves, yes, though we're not going to really dive into different types of optimizers or, or the, the variations uh, in the optimization algorithm. Um, but, but, but the short answer is yes, there is. But, but even more to that point, there is some, some trade-off even in what we can easily tweak, um, which is actually what I'm going to talk about right this second. Um, and so, so the answer is yes on, on both uh, counts. The, the other problem we can run into with a with a, a gradient descent is this is this divergence that can happen. So if we again just suppose that we started at this point and our algorithm tells us to go down, our, our gradient descent tells us that we need to move to the left. But if we're moving to the left by too large an amount, and this gets into something called learning rate, what we do is we actually take our, our slope our derivative, and we multiply it by, by some value to decide how fast we're going to move. This goes back to the question that was just asked, is how fast do we converge? How fast do we get to the best option? Now, we can control that a little bit with something called learning rate, but if we have too big of a learning rate, look what happens. My gradient descent tells me I'm here and I, and I, I should go to the left. My model parameter should be a lower number, but I decide to make it too big. I jump by too big of an amount. And when I do that, I actually am in a worse spot. Here's what happens. Because I'm in now an even higher gradient, a higher slope, if you will, right? Now it's going to jump again back to the right by even more because it uses that slope as well as our learning rate to decide how much. Learning rate's a number we control, the slope is just dictated by the algorithm. So those two things together decide how much we jump. And you can see when we set that learning rate real high, we jumped now again too much. And so now we're doing what we call diverging. We're actually getting worse and worse every time. And eventually, eventually we'll get to a point where this is no longer a problem. Uh, it, it'll start to flatten out. And so now maybe here we get to this point and then it, it, then it, it so it still converges, it just converges pretty high up and in a non and not very optimal value. Whereas at some point, if you look through your training history, you'll say, hey, at some point it was this good, but it settled out up here. This is where it settled. Now, that divergence problem, and actually it can get worse if you have complicated shapes. Say it was diverging right here, then it would just go out. Um, these Both these problems we talked about, the divergence, as well as the, um, the, the, the local optima problem can be mitigated by tweaking our learning rate, but, but, but towards different effects. This happened when we had too big of a learning rate because we were jumping too high. However, a large learning rate can actually help us jump over the local optima problem. You can see that here, we could have ended up in a local optimum if we had a small learning rate, but with a large learning rate, it hopped over subtle, slight, irrelevant differences, uh, it, basically things that might have just been been variants in our input data. It had a it did a better job dealing with that variance in our input data. Right. So so learning rate size too is a thing that we have to experiment with. There's no perfectly right answer. Anything to add before we uh, get you back into code, Glenn? No, no, I think that's that's fairly spot on. So we're going to jump into our, our last exercise, which, which is to look at gradient descent in a little bit more action. So there's a, there's a few more steps here, but essentially we're, we're loading the data, we're preparing our model, we'll go through the 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 intercept and slope and, and see where we can see the gradient descent in action and try and essentially make a, a better fit for it and have a look visually with some some charts about how, how that might work. Awesome. Let me sh share my screen. And 
<laughs> just move the window with you out of the way. So we're going to look at this gradient descent. So I might I might just go through the, the process again. So essentially, we're going to again use pandas to load that data and, and work with it. And in this case here, we've got a few things that are going on. We're going to remove the the entries from July. And this is because of really the, the temperature in your part of the world, Jason, where it gets cold yes. from, from, from that chunk of time. So here we've got the, the month is left less than seven. Seven. So essentially January through to June. And, and yeah. Now, is this is this a right thing to do? That this, of course, you know, is is an interesting question. We 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 know that that we know for sure that that in our given our business constraints, we won't do anything after July. So one could argue that that we don't want our data to be confused by variants that might happen in say September. If there's some weird weird variants in there, we don't want to we don't want that to mess up our data. You know, on the other hand, we're we're throwing away good reliable data, so it's again a thing we'd want to experiment with. I wouldn't want to just assume throwing away the last 6 months of every year is a, is a good way to handle yeah, it. Yeah, I am a big fan of more data, more, especially more quality data where I, where we can. All right, so let's go ahead and, and run this cell. So we're also setting up another column here for the year, which is essentially taking that that midpoint through the year as well. And then we're we're charting that once the data is available and processed. Yep, we're working it. Yeah, there we are. Just Beautiful. So here we've got the temperature over time in Fahrenheit from 1950 all the way to 2017. Cool. And, and like it says here, it's a visual check. So we just we wanted to look at the, the shape of the data quite often and visibly graph it where we can. Especially it's it's a lot easier when you've just got two axes though as well. All right, so let's fit a line to this data using the existing library that we used in last week's session, which is just using that ordinary least squares. And we'll do that just to get a sense of what the data should be. It's a, a comparison at this stage. We're not doing the, the involved training like we had been in the, the two previous exercises. But you can see here we've got the, the slope and the intercept, which is at um, 0 0.063. That's the, the slope. And the intercept is minus 83 in Fahrenheit. Um, I always have to do math in my head when I'm converting to Celsius. <laughs> We, we, we will actually go through it and, and you know train it ourselves again and even we'd be using our own optimizer this time. Uh, but but one thing we actually are going to do with this is we wanted to get a baseline. So we, we use this other library to get a baseline of, of uh, what is the right answer and where is it going to be centered around? And that's because just for teaching purposes, we're, we're going to hack some data in there and get a visual of that that error function. So, so go ahead and do that for us if you would, Glenn. Excellent. So that's we've already gone, gone ahead and run that cell, I believe. Yeah, that's fine. That's our, our data at the, the end. And then it's a matter of uh, essentially updating the, the model class here. So we have that model class very similar to what we created before. There's an additional method here called get summary, which just updates the, the display. Well, we'll use that to up, update the display showing the, the slope and intercept while we're training. It's really for our, our, our own benefit anyway. So I've run that. That's really just defining the class. I see that my visualization didn't come up yet, darn. <laughs> oh, okay. Where did my visualization go? It'll, it'll oh, be there soon. Yeah, yay. here we go. <laughs> so, so then we're going to fit the model with gradient descent. So essentially it's going to take us through that, that process you showed us before where we're going to look at the value, compare where we should be based on the slope, and then adjust our, our, our values to try and see if we can get the the, the smallest cost value we possibly can. So I might get you to explain this process, Jason. So we've actually, we've yeah, got... if you wouldn't mind running it while I while I start explaining, because we're gonna sure. we're actually gonna gonna look back down. Um, re remember we we used the library a, a minute ago and and got the correct answers. Well, now we're going to center around those correct answers, but get a bunch of other values for our parameters now. The way that, that this is not how we do training in the real world, but but we're going to be demonstrating and getting a view of that that error function for for our own for our own sake. So what we did is we got the correct values, and then this this np lin space that you see twice right there, 
uh, that is just creating a bunch of other values in the neighborhood of of what the correct values were up there. And that's going to to then allow us to see both the best option and its its neighboring options. And then essentially we use a, a cost function and predicting calc the same way we would in training. The only difference is instead of instead of having an optimizer tell us what our next parameter is, we're just going to keep going back to this list that we that we hard coded. That that we, we hard coded with the lens the linear space there. Oh, so look, and and what's that going to do is then give us something that we can graph in terms of all of the different errors that we got, and I think that should be showing up at the bottom now. That that graph that we have. There we are. <laughs> for a second, it didn't show up. Oh, I was nervous. <laughs> yeah, I think it was waiting for me to scroll just a little bit. That's fine. So we've got that surface, and it's showing a few axes here. We've got the model intercept, the model slope, and also the cost. So one of the nice things about this chart is I can actually rotate it, and look we can cool see that. that yeah, it's pretty neat. <laughs> I love and that. then, and then if I look down here towards the the bottom value, this is probably where the cost is going to be minimized somewhere about here. Yeah. One one of the nice things about this graph too is if you notice actually the right hand uh, the right hand uh, it, uh, guide or key it, it shows us that as we get to that darker color that's actually a lower value so instead of trying to to look at cost and the shape we, if you if you kind of give us a, a dimension where where cost is the z axis if you're able to do that I know sometimes spinning that thing can be a little difficult but if you're able to. Where Almost there. <laughs> yeah, it gets a little tricky, doesn't it? Yeah, it is a little tricky. Well, what, what I'm trying to, uh, to to demonstrate here is that we can go along the intercept axis and we can go along the uh, the slope axis and we can find the different values that we tried. And we can see that if we had started, say, somewhere in the orange area, then our slope would start telling us that we should move a little bit towards the center, a little bit towards the center, a little bit towards the center. And, and, and that is exactly what our gradient descent is going to do. It's going to get that error function, find out what the slope is given the inputs, and then move us along. Awesome. So that's what we're doing, except except our, our gradient descent process doesn't have the benefit of knowing the correct answer in advance and then centering around it like we did. That's why we cheated a little bit. Cool. So we could show you that cool graph. All right. So that's that's a look at the, the graph. Let's actually go ahead and 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 calculate some gradient. So we're doing some calculus here where we're looking at the the slope, right? Let me let me run this if you want to speak to it, Jason. Yeah, and remember, I said it wouldn't be intimidating. Now, 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 knowing how to do things like uh, like uh, actually uh, explain and justify uh, the the derivatives of of functions is some some challenging stuff. However, uh, applying it to certain functions like this is is not bad at all. What we what we have actually, since we used our mean squared error, uh, the derivative of the of the overall. Uh, error is actually just going to be it times two, uh, and then using a couple well-known calculus functions, we're able to to kind of uh, uh, pull out the individual uh, components, and so you can see that that the the input to this function is um, the errors for each record, and so we mean that we, we're basically getting the average of all those errors um, for the slope. We multiply it by all of the all of the inputs. And match their errors and we get what should be the update for that so now we have with that we have those those slopes right and, and we're going to use <laughs> sorry didn't mean to, to speak over you there jason um yeah i think we were probably about to say the same thing which is that the only thing now that we need is to take the 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 slopes at the slope update and the uh, the intercept update uh, multiply it by whatever learning rate we've picked and then we can we can update our parameter and try to train again. Awesome. So I'm going to run this cell, which is actually going to do that loop. It's actually very similar to uh, what we did before, but this time we're using the, the gradient descent to actually try and find the, the better cost function value that we're working with. And if I scroll down here, you can see that over time, we're, we, we can see the costs just shrink down, like from 15,000 all the way down to about 60. Yeah, what, the end. let me call out one thing really quick since we did have some questions on, on normalization earlier. One of the, if, if you scroll up just a little bit, Glenn, 
you, you, you'll notice that we're actually cheating here and only updating slope. The reason is because our our um, our magnitudes are very different. We didn't normalize this model. So if 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 you if you see the actual uh, the actual values we're dealing with, we're dealing with very small decimals and then a, a very large integer number. So it would take a long time to converge. It's it's actually not a bad exercise if you guys want to take it away, if you all want to take it away, do the normalization like we did in exercise one. Apply that to this data set, and you can do that right here in this Jupyter Notebook, right here in the Learn interface. Apply that, and then also update your intercept parameter. It's it's just a few added lines of code. It'll take some thinking to figure out exactly how those lines of code should be, but it's it's a few lines of code. It's a great exercise to take away home because it is something you can do with just what we've taught in this class. Awesome. Cool. So let's go ahead and, and run this gradient descent again. So it found the right answer. And we want to be able to run that with a, a different number of iterations and a different learning rate as well. So it took a bunch of bunch of loops really to to get to that point. In this case, it was a thousand iterations. You can see we've in, increased our learning rate and only are doing 20% of the, the iterations from before. And it roughly is getting to a very similar answer. If you look at that, 60.32 is the cost, 60.317 as the cost here. So actually slightly better. <laughs> slightly better, right? Yeah. yeah. So that, so that was by increasing the learning rate. So in other words, bigger jumps got us to the better answer faster, which sort of makes sense. Right. But. <laughs> so let's change that. We'll increase it even more. And now our cost is infinity. That doesn't seem like it's a better answer, that's Jason. Probably, that's probably not helpful, is it? So, <laughs> no. so we, we, we have a very large learning rate here. Our, our jumps got so big that we really couldn't surf the uh, the curve of the cost function anymore. We just started leaping over the whole graph. <laughs> right. So it, it pays really to experiment with what the, the learning rate should be, right? That's right. Cool. So any, anything else to add? On this exercise, Jason, I'm really tight on I time. Think, I think that's it. Yeah, we're starting to get pretty close here, aren't we? We are. All right, let's let's do our final knowledge check then, shall we? Oh wait, we want to tell you all to go to aka.ms slash learn live TV again to answer questions yourself. Okay. Now you can ask. <laughs> all right. I'll ask away. <laughs> so question three is, how does gradient descent know how to update the parameters? Does it compare the cost for a number of combinations of parameters and then selects the best one? Does it use an internal understanding of the relationship between features and labels to make intelligent choices? Or does it use calculus to estimate the, the slope of the cost function? Well, does it compare costs for several combinations of the parameters and then select the best option? This actually is um, something that could theoretically work, but it's certainly not going to be uh, not going to be efficient. <laughs> is does it use an internal understanding of the relationship between features and labels? I hope not. If we have an internal understanding that's not well defined by the math, we're in trouble. So, does it use calculus to estimate the slope? The answer is absolutely yes. Cool. How do we uh, actually? How do we do? How do we do in the in the world? We got well, hundred percent so far. Yeah, that's right. There's a slight delay, but it, yeah, I think when when calculus comes up, people go, "Oh no, is it integration? Is it all that stuff?" It's actually just looking at the slope for the most part. It's actually the the least difficult part of calculus in my experience. It, it is. It absolutely is. Yes, so far. Yeah, so far. <laughs> all um, right. Deep learning calculus gets a little scary sometimes. <laughs> cool. And, and, and looking at the numbers, yeah, uh, most people got that one right as well. Awesome. All right. Question four, why are there many cost functions available? Is it A, a unique cost function is required for, for each process um, currency or banking system? B, because cost functions help models process data and many model types are available? Or is it C, because different cost functions can arrive at different answers? And what is best depends really on our goal. Well, I like this question. What do you think? Well, 
It's definitely not true that it, you need cost functions required for, for, for well, for currency is certainly not the case. That's for sure. I, I know we have the word cost in there. That's probably the uh, probably the bit, but it's definitely not the case. And it's not, not the case that we would need it for each domain or anything like that either. Uh, cost functions may help or because cost functions help models process data and many model types are available, that's not it. How about because different cost functions can arrive at different answers and what is best depends. The classic answer, it depends. Yeah, that, that's good. <laughs> you know, and, and everyone who answered that at, at the time got that right as well. I think there was some some people answering B as well, but B is not quite the, the right answer. There's um, Not quite. It, yeah, it's, it's not as bad as A. <laughs> I, I can understand B for sure. Yeah. <laughs> can understand the, that answer coming across. I mean, there, there are lots of model types, but often the model types might use the same cost function, right? Absolutely. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So I think good answer there. Lots of, lots of um, responses too, which is lovely. All right. Question five. I believe this is our last question. It is. Or, yeah. Why is learning rate important? Is it A, it speeds up or slows down training? B, if it's too large or too small, it can prevent a model from being trained optimally? Or is it C, both options are correct? Well, does it speed up or slow down training? It sure can. If too large or too small, it can prevent a model from being trained optimally. Yep, it sure can. I think that means the correct answer is C. All yeah, options are correct. You know what? And everyone who's answering in the chat window agrees with you, Jason. So that, that, well done, folks. Well done. Good. Bit of crowdsourcing <laughs> on that one. That, that's um, excellent. So I think that's that's some really good responses from everyone. Looks like everyone's paying attention, um, which is lovely as well. And let's let's move on because we we're really just going to summarize what we've learned so far. And yeah, Jason, you well, want to take us through it? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this quickly because I'd love to have a chance to to field a few questions from uh, from the folks out there. Uh, so so we really did take our second pass at peeling the onion layers away at the big picture of machine learning on this one. We did a lot of the same things we did last time, but this time we implemented them ourselves. And we talked about why we were making those decisions or why those things were done that were kind of under the hood or abstracted from us in episode one. This is kind of our, our final episode on the, on the very, very, very high level. After this, we're gonna start digging into some more some more kind of detailed verticals where we're not going to keep doing that overall survey. And we're going to actually start with data next, which is not just training a model. With, with, with our data, we're going to be just looking at the raw data, slicing it, understanding it, building, building actually even, even intuitive models that aren't machine learning models, but are, are just as meaningful in terms of looking at understanding our data and providing business value. That's next week. Awesome. And we've got a bit more after that, training and understanding regression models, refining and testing machine learning models, some, some other things which are probably too much to say right now, but certainly come back. Or if you're interested, look at the learning path link that we, we have on the top of the screen, the Learn ML, that will take you to the, the complete path. Awesome. And then for, for going through and doing doing this module that we did today that we all did together today but but you want to do it by yourself you want to you want to take that challenge i offered about normalizing and retraining the uh retraining that last exercise then go on over to aka.ms slash learn ml dash classical ml for sure excellent and i think we've got a, a few minutes for questions maybe get a Jason. couple in there if we yeah, have let, let's some folks with questions Oh, I love this question already. Could you use classic ML to do things like image recognition? It's a it's it's an interesting question. The 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 technical answer is yes. And in fact, one of the one of the most common demos that you'll see is to use classical ML to 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 recognize handwritten numbers. Uh, this actually is also fun fact. One of the one of the first uh, commercial uses of machine learning was to use the the the, the classic demo data set, this MNIST data set, uh, which is black and white handwritten numbers. And yes, you can absolutely use classic ML. Uh, quite a few different algorithms will work for it. Uh, as a matter of fact, to to recognize handwritten digits. 
Um, if you start getting into recognizing more elaborate type of type of, of of images, you're definitely going to start to want to look at more more complex machine learning architectures like like deep learning architectures and CNN architectures. Uh, but but for some purposes, uh, it, it absolutely could be used. Yeah, and just to add to that as well, I think for for many situations, you might find some of the cognitive services that we offer also implement some of that functionality. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, it, sometimes sometimes doing it yourself is is the wrong answer because there are a lot of uh, boxed products, especially for Microsoft, especially in terms of our cognitive services and our applied AI that will get you what you want just by signing up and making an API. Call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, just a reference here in Australia, I remember at the Microsoft office here, like a bunch of years ago, I, I created an app called What Snake Just Bit Me, because I had a, a data set of all these images from my friend who was a snake catcher. And I just took photos and and trained the model just using the images. We had all the, the labels of what they were, similar to what we would, were doing in the, the supervised situation. And I was able to, able to take another photo that wasn't trained and go, what snake it was. And it was really accurate. There's some great... Um, great services out there on Azure. Thank you so, for yeah. thank you for giving us that authentic Australian flavor right there. <laughs> it's what I do. it's what I do. All right. So there's also another question: uh, What courses should I take to get good at ML? Well, what got you good at ML, Jason? Well, I, there, there's there's a lot of good content out there. Um, I, I actually would would focus on uh, a couple things that are offered by Microsoft is is what I'd like uh, people to focus on. So, so if you go, actually, let me uh, let me go ahead and maybe even share my screen for it. And if you look at our Microsoft.com website. The Machine Learning for Data Scientists has a lot of good content for using our Azure products, uh, using our Azure products for doing machine learning. Now, if you're more interested in the concepts of machine learning, of course, the AKA that we've been throwing at you this whole time is, is super important. The, uh, the one that will take you to this learning path. And in addition to this learning path, um, there there is linked some other options. Option two, option one, option three. Uh, we're we're going through this course with option two, but option one and option uh, three are are also great. And then finally, for some more kind of interesting scenarios that also play with deep learning and do some uh, some things like that, I have something offered by our amazing cloud advocate team one of one of uh, whom is actually working with us in the chat today and that is this uh, ml for beginners so they go through using several libraries for for um, both classic ml and deep learning they do talk about uh, data prep it's it's very much complementary to the to the learning path that we're working with uh, here awesome i think we've only got time for a, a couple more questions and we have to be very quick with the answers here as well. Uh, Mika has a question. When we say classic ML, are we talking machine learning, not using Python ML libraries like sklearn? I think we're talking about the, the classical techniques really, instead of the libraries there, Mika. Yeah, yeah. sklearn typically does use classic algorithms. So, so scikit-learn and most of the techniques that we would use, most of the techniques that we would use with scikit-learn uh, would come under the heading of classical ML. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, but so, less so things like PyTorch. Right. So we have uh, we have about one minute left. So we might have to, um, hopefully the moderators can answer the, the other questions in the chat. But we'll just move to the last slide and, and say a, a fond farewell for now. And thanks everyone for attending this session. We're hoping, hoping you'll come back for the, the next seven sessions that we have in the series. We hope you've learned a lot. Um, I can see a comment from Nate. Thank you, Jason Glenn. We appreciate you, you sticking around, Nate. And we hope to, again, see you real soon. Bye for now. Bye, folks.